Good morning everyone and welcome to another episode of A Perambulate with Picard and today I'm going to be discussing episode 9 It's in Arcadia Ego part 1 Now uh, for those of you wondering why I am out and about I am still working at the moment however my work is a very short distance from my home and I am working in isolation so I am taking care of myself and I encourage all of you to do the same so, Et in Arcadia Ego. Let's start with the title. It is Latin, of course, and roughly translates as Even in Arcadia There Am I. And it's used in a lot of art and literature over the last, ooh, half millennia or so, um, about four or five hundred years. And the I in it is usually said to stand for death. So even in Arcadia, which is like a a sort of meadow, an idyll, just somewhere really, really nice, <laughs> essentially. Um, even in that location, one can find death. It's first used in a painting showing uh, two shepherds uh, looking upon a skull whilst in the middle of their field. And uh, yeah, it's kind of appropriate here because uh, the planet of the synths, we finally reach it and they do live in an idyllic pastoral setting, but even in there, there is death. Now, does death refer to the act of people dying, or does it refer to a bringer of death, an anthropomorphic personification of death? And I think we get both in this episode. Now, um, there's always some weird structural stuff going on with Picard, so... At the beginning of this, we get to see um, the ball cube come through, save Picard's ship, and then both ships crash land because they're intercepted by these giant space flowers, which look rather like the giant space flower in the opening of Discovery, which we still haven't seen in Discovery. Um, although that could just be representing the mycelial network, I suppose. And yeah, so the crew set out, Picard finally tells everyone about his condition and <laughs> I just really love the way he does that. It's so matter of fact and he's like, and if anyone wants to treat me differently, I'm going to get annoyed. Although he doesn't say annoyed, but I can't say what he did say here. Um, <laughs> and it's just a lovely, it's just a lovely scene and it is exactly the way Picard would tell people about his illness. They then um, toddle along onto the Borg cube so that uh, uh, Jerry, Ryan and Evan Evagoria can have their scenes this week. Um, I still don't see the point of Elnor, I'm sorry. But the good thing is, I really like Evan Evagoria's performance and he gets the whole breathless honesty thing really well. <laughs> And I just love that Agnes tops into Elnor um, about Picard's condition, and we immediately know it's Agnes, and Picard immediately knows it's Agnes. It's a nice bit of levity for a very serious scene. Um, yeah, I'm sure that Elnor and Seven will be doing some stuff next week to justify that scene. This is what I mean about weird structural stuff. It's like, this scene exists entirely because you know they're going to be there next week. So at the synth encampment, um, home I suppose, we meet a bunch of other synths. And what I found interesting looking at the cast list is that the synths all seem to be named after ways to communicate. There's, there's Rune, there's Arcana, there's Codex, and of course Sutra, who is another Soji type, if you like. And but all these other synths, they look like Data. They've got his skin, they've got his yellow eyes, and we meet Alton Inigo Sung, who is the heretofore unknown son, biological son, rather than technological son, of Dr. Noonien Sung, Data's creator. And I have to say, it's wonderful to see Brent Spiner back, and, you know, we don't have to put him through that de-aging process which was ambitious and worked as well as could be expected but it's nice to see Brent Spiner 
in his real form, if you like. But I have to say, as soon as he walked up, I just thought, so Sung had a son we didn't know about for all this time. Uh, I think it's law. I think Alton Sung is law. Law is very clever. For those of you who don't know, Law is Data's brother, for want of a better word. So, just like Soji and Daj were created together, Nuni and Sung made two androids. He made Law first, and Law was imperfect, so he made Data. But Law is pretty much, I think you, I'm not sure you'd say chaotic evil, <laughs> but He's pretty evil. And if this whole simp thing is building up to this other race, this other techno race, who um, seek to help synthetic life forms rid themselves of pesky organics, I think that's the kind of thing Law would be involved in. And Law is certainly capable of acting friendly to get what he wants. And we see that in his very first appearance. When we last see him in Star Trek Next Generation, Data deactivates him, and I don't think we hear anything about what happens to him after that. We know his emotion chip is removed because Data eventually gets it uh, and starts using it. But, yeah, it could be lore. It could be lore. It might not be. It could just be an excuse to use Brent Spiner in the show in such a way that we don't have to use vast quantities of anti-aging makeup and anti-aging CG. Um, and I'm perfectly fine with that if that is the case. But it just it, it was an odd moment to me as a long-term viewer. Um, now, Agnes, of course, her art continues a bit here as she tries to atone for what she's done by passing on the admonition. And I love the idea that the reason it sends or can send um, organic creatures insane is that it's designed for a machine intelligence. It's, it's a computer program. It doesn't run in an organic brain because it's a computer program. And as soon as it's revealed that, you know, it's this other technological race that comes along and helps out synthetic life. Now, I think we're meant to think that it's the Borg because, you know, we've had the Borg all the way through this series. But the thing is, the Borg don't destroy organic life that is oppressing synthetic life. It's kind of interested in synthetic life, it was interested in data, but they absorb Someone just did a very silly turn out there. They absorb organic life into themselves. But I just got to thinking immediately, what technological races have we seen before in Star Trek that are not too big on organic life? Carbon units, they might call us. I'm thinking it's whatever technological race rescued the Voyager probe, Vija, and sent it back towards Earth with a new mission to wipe out organic life. And I would love to see that because I love Star Trek The Motion Picture where they appear. And I would just love to see that alien race return. No, it's decided not to go off for me again, so I'm going to go this way. And you know what? I think Agnes is probably the character who's had the best arc this season. You know, we've seen, we've seen Raffi overcome her substance issues, briefly lapse, but then just become absolutely brilliant. Dust in my eye. Um, but I went from really not liking Agnes for what she did to Bruce, but now not only do I understand why she did what she did, she is actively trying to atone for it and being terribly brave, even though she is a very timid character. Um, yeah, she's definitely had the best arc this season, possibly even including Picard. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just thought, I thought that getting the information out of her might kill her and the androids would just be like, oh, well, you know, needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. 
Um, but thankfully that's not the case. And something that just seems to be a recurring factor this season is that there are very few characters who are out and out evil. You know, even at the end of this episode when the synths decide, nope, we can't trust organic life, we can't trust the Federation, they justify that well. And it is understandable, especially I was watching it and when Picard starts saying, I will speak on your behalf, it's like, Picard, you don't have that influence. You know, you can't guarantee their safety. And Sutra cuts right to the point where she's like, you know, we're not your, we're not your um, redemption for, um, for what happened to the Romulans. Now, this is another thing that makes me think that law might be involved. And that is, why can't Picard get a signal out to Starfleet? You know, I know this planet is hidden, but they don't explain at any point why he can't get that signal out. And I wonder if Law is jamming him. <sighs> but overall, this is a good setup for the finale. I hope they stick the landing. I absolutely love Raffi and Picard saying goodbye to each other and Patrick Stewart's perfect reaction to Raffi saying, I love you. <laughs> like, at first it's that shock, and then he just says, I love you too, and wanders off. It really, it really fits the character. And, you know, he's already discussed how he, <laughs> he and Data both share, you know, limited expressions of emotion. And it just perfectly fits, not only for him, but for Raffi, because I've really enjoyed Michelle Hurd's performance. I have to say, I've enjoyed all the regulars performance this season, um, the guest cast as well. Yeah, it's been a really strong show cast-wise. It has had pacing issues, but we are rattling along towards the finale now, and I'm really looking forward to that next week. Now, next week I may be working from home, but if I am, don't worry, I've got a balcony that I can pace up and down while I do my last review. But I'd be very interested to hear what you think down there in the comments. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. But until next time, thank you so much for watching and don't forget to wash your hands.